I'm Tyler Vanderweel at Harvard University, and I will be speaking today on the topic of flourishing in medicine. I'll talk briefly about the concept of human flourishing, and also about how to potentially try to assess this empirically in practice. I'll go on to discuss what some of the major public pathways to flourishing might be, and then I will shift uh, the emphasis to ask how and in what ways might this concept of flourishing be relevant uh, for medicine. I'll talk a bit about um, the clinical, potential clinical implications of um, this concept of flourishing and how I think medicine and clinical practice might move forward making use of this concept and these ideas. More information on the conceptualization of flourishing that I will be presenting today. It's in this 2017 paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, and some initial discussion on the clinical implications of this notion of flourishing is in this 2019 paper in JAMA. Uh, more information at the Human Flourishing Program at Harvard can be found on our website. Um, so many of our institutions and academic disciplines have very grand visions of flourishing. The World Health Organization's definition of health from 1948 still in place today is that health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Economics and positive psychology likewise have very expansive visions. Uh, but in practice, uh, many of our discussions and studies and efforts are oriented towards addressing much more narrow outcomes. For example, specific disease states uh, in medicine or simple measures of feeling happy in, in, in psychology or, or simply income in economics. But flourishing is arguably a much broader concept. If we turn to our dictionaries, the Oxford English Dictionary defines flourishing as to grow or develop in a healthy or vigorous way. Uh, the American Heritage Dictionary, to do or fare well. Uh, the etymology of the term comes from Latin florere, to bloom, blossom, or flower. Uh, it's the word often used to translate Aristotle's eudaimonia, sometimes also translated as happiness. The working definition that we've been using at the Human Flourishing Program at Harvard is that flourishing is living in a state in which all aspects of a person's life are good. This is arguably what we're after as individuals and really should be after as a society. And as I'll discuss in due course, I think has relevance in our um, consideration of what takes place in medicine. I think the discipline that's come closest to trying to capture this notion of flourishing is, is that of um, positive psychology, and, and many measures of psychological well-being have been put forward, conceptualizations have been put forward in um, that literature. Um, but noticeably absent from these notions of psychological well-being, which is going to be problematic for uh, medicine, is, is any notion of physical health, and are we really fully flourishing if, if, we're, if we're bedridden or um, seriously ill, surely physical health itself, uh, central focus of medicine, ought to be part of some notion of flourishing. O often also missing from these conceptualizations of flourishing in the psychology literature is any notion of, of character or virtue, contrary to Plato, Aristotle, most of the Western philosophical tradition, and really um, philosophical and religious traditions worldwide. Um, but with a conception so broad, we might wonder, um, you know, is it ever really possible to do any sort of empirical assessment? Can we ever achieve any sort of consensus on, on, on what this is? And, and you know, surely conceptions of flourishing will, will differ across um, individuals and, and cultures and religious and philosophical traditions. And, and while I think that is the case, while I think um, you know, well-developed notions of flourishing do differ across cultures, um, I do think one can focus on, on where there's overlap, where there might be um, consensus. And so what I would argue is that whatever else might be within one's concept of flourishing, I think any reasonable conception of flourishing would include um, the following five domains of, of human life. Um, the argument here is not that flourishing is reducible to these five, um, but, but that each, five, each of these five is, is arguably part of it. And these would be happiness and life satisfaction, physical and mental health, meaning and purpose, character and virtue, and close social relationships. Again, the argument's not that these exhaust flourishing, but each is a part of it. 
Um, I think each of these five domains also satisfies the following uh, two criteria. Um, each is nearly universally desired, and we have some empirical data on this as well. Um, and each is an end in and of itself. Each of these is sought for its own sake, not merely as a means to some other end. And I think these two criteria, being universally desired and being an end, might help shape consensus around what to measure. Um, so it's a very crude measure and assessment of flourishing. We've um, taken two questions in each of these five domains, drawn principally from the existing uh, questions that have been used in the well-being literature, um, questions that have received at least some degree of empirical uh, validation and that are in somewhat widespread uh, use. The only two questions which are newly proposed in this flourishing assessment are that in the character domain, and although there's been some very good work on an uh, empirical assessment of character over the last 20 years, um, it, it often requires a very extensive assessment. There was very little with regard to global assessments of character using just one or two um, items. So we worked with, with philosophers to develop assessments of um, character based on the notion of the cardinal virtues that at the foundation of all um, moral virtues lie, lie for uh, practical wisdom, justice, fortitude, or courage, and, and moderation, or, or temperance. Um, and so the 10 questions we've been using in our research with regard to flourishing assessments are, are as follows. Uh, in the first domain, happiness and life satisfaction, we have how satisfied are you with life as a whole these days, uh, scored from zero, completely unsatisfied, to 10, completely satisfied. And this is perhaps the most widely used well-being question in the, in the literature. It's used in the UK's um, annual survey. It's used by the OECD. It's been used by, by Gallup and numerous other surveys worldwide. And then we supplement that with a more um, effective assessment about feeling happy in general. How happy or unhappy do you usually feel? A scored again zero, extremely unhappy to 10, extremely uh, happy. Uh, and then the second domain, physical and uh, mental health. Uh, these two questions were drawn from the US General Social Survey and the World Health Organization's uh, survey for mental health. But uh, in general, how would you rate your physical health, zero to 10? How would you rate your overall mental health, zero to 10? Uh, then in the third domain, uh, meaning and purpose, uh, first question, overall, to what extent do you feel the things you do in your life are worthwhile? Again, scored 0 to 10. And this question is likewise very widely um, used, used once again in the UK's annual survey by the OECD by numerous cohort studies uh, as well. Um, and then that's supplemented by something more cognitive. Uh, I understand my purpose in life. Uh, 0 completely disagree, 10 completely agree. Uh, the fourth domain, uh, character and virtue. Uh, first question intended in some crude way to assess um, uh, practical wisdom and justice. I always act to promote good in all circumstances, even in difficult and challenging uh, situations. Uh, zero completely untrue of me, 10 completely true of me. And then a, a second question intended to crudely assess uh, fortitude and moderation. I'm always able to give up some happiness now for a greater happiness later. Uh, and then the fifth domain is uh, close social relationships. Uh, these two questions were drawn from the UK's Campaign to End Loneliness, a survey of short social connectedness instruments. Um, first question, I am content with my friendships and relationships. Uh, zero completely disagree, 10 completely agree. Uh, this question tended in, in some way to try to get at the, the quantity of those relationships. Um, and then second, my relationships are as satisfying as I would like them to be, again, zero to 10. Uh, intended to capture something of the quality of those relationships. Uh, in most of the empirical work we've been doing, we report um, the scores in each of these five domains uh, separately because, as, as you'll um, see, the dynamics really can be quite different across the domains. Sometimes we'll also take the average of all um, 10 as a crude assessment of flourishing, but really this should be understood as nothing more than an average of those five um, more meaningful uh, domain-specific assessments. Um, we also typically in our work supplement these with two questions on financial and material stability as important means to sustaining these other uh, ends of flourishing and these two questions drawn from the um, financial well-being literature are first how often do you worry about being able to meet normal monthly living expenses, uh, zero worry all the time, ten uh, do not ever worry. 
Um, how often do you worry about safety, food, or housing? Again, zero to 10. Um, and so sometimes we'll take the average of all uh, 12 questions for a secure flourishing index, perhaps less satisfactory uh, conceptually because financial resources are means, not ends, but, but arguably more satisfactory in, in practice as insofar as indicating flourishing over a more extended period of time. Um, so as an example of how you know, these sorts of assessments can be useful for tracking what's happening to an individual or to a, a population, we collected um, data on a roughly nationally representative sample of the United States on these flourishing questions, both prior to the uh, WHO declaration of the COVID-19 pandemic in January of 2020, and also in the midst of it in June of 2020. Um, in January of 2020, in the United States, the average across the domains was, was about seven, really cl very close to seven in each of those domains, except financial and material uh, stability, where we had uh, nearly a point lower, or nearly a full point lower in terms of the, the mean. Um, unsurprisingly, during COVID-19, the mean and all of these um, dimensions and flourishing uh, as a whole went, went down, um, but the domains were affected quite differently. Um, happiness and, and life satisfaction, again, perhaps unsurprisingly, went down by about seven tenths of a point. Likewise, physical and mental health, perhaps unsurprisingly, went down about seven tenths of a point. Uh, the largest fall, nearly a point, was in financial and material stability. Um, and, and again, this was June 2020 at the height of the U.S. Uh, unemployment. Um, so, so big losses in these domains. Um, but also, interestingly, much smaller losses, or, or, or in some cases, no change at all with the other three domains. Meaning and purpose went down a little bit, but not all that much. Um, the character assessment essentially was level during these two time periods. And somewhat surprisingly, um, the close social relationships assessment went down a little bit, but, but not all that much, two-tenths of a um, point. And, and this has been corroborated by, by other studies, studies looking at loneliness, which showed, again, perhaps surprisingly, that loneliness has increased a little bit, but not all that much during um, the pandemic. People have found ways to um, connect with either those they're, they're, they're living with or possibly uh, virtually. Importantly, however, um, uh, the change in means does um, disguise uh, variability in experience. And if you look at the standard deviations, those have increased uh, during the, the COVID-19 pandemic in each of these um, domains. So while um, the pandemic may have led some to, to even better relationships, investing those relationships with those one is living with, and um, for others, perhaps those living alone, this is, was perhaps a particularly uh, difficult time. But in any case, these sorts of assessments can allow one to see how um, how a particular population or, or a particular individual is doing in life and, and how that's changing um, over time. Um, so, you know, all this might be fine and good in terms of ass assessment and understanding, um, but obviously we also want to be able to promote um, well-being or, or, or flourishing. And I'll first speak about this from the perspective of um, population well-being, and then I'll move on to discuss potential clinical uh, implications of these sorts of assessments. Uh, with regard to trying to promote population flourishing. Um, if, if one takes the lens of assessing public health um, impact, often this is done as a function of two things if we're trying to understand the importance of an exposure phenomena or, or intervention. Um, a function of first, the prevalence of the exposure, how common is it? And secondly, the size of its effects on the outcomes uh, that we care about. Something that is very common and has large effects on the outcomes we care about um, is going to shape population health. Um, so if we use this sort of lens to think about what are the major determinants for, for physical health, we're, we're led to things like exercise, nutrition, not smoking, um, and sleep. Uh, but we might broaden our set of, of outcomes and, um, and, and ask what exposures or phenomena shape not just physical health, but all of these domains of flourishing, happiness and life satisfaction, physical and mental health, uh, meaning and purpose, character, close relationships. Um, what, what things are both common and have large effects on each of um, these domains of flourishing? Um, and, and if we ask that question, looking at all five domains of flourishing, we end up with a somewhat different uh, list. Uh, and so um, based on a literature review of, of rigorous longitudinal experimental and um, quasi-experimental designs, literature review described a paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, I would, I would propose four major pathways to promote population flourishing. Um, and those are family, work, 
education and religious community. Uh, there's evidence that each of these is relatively common in, in population in, in the United States and, and worldwide, um, and that each has uh, relatively substantial effects on the various domains of flourishing. Um, evidence for that, and again, rigorous uh, longitudinal experimental and quasi-experimental studies. Uh, the argument here is not that these are exhaustive. There can be important things for flourishing in, in one's life, um, uh, per perhaps for some engagement in, in, in the arts, say, uh, might, might contribute substantially to, to each of these um, domains, but are perhaps less common in terms of the actual participation. But in any case, the argument's not that these are exhaustive, um, no, nor is the argument that these four are, are necessary. One can flourish even in the absence of one or more of these pathways. Uh, rather, the argument that is that there's evidence that each of these pathways powerfully affects the different flourishing domains. And so if, if policy efforts contributed to en enhancing and enabling uh, these different uh, pathways that population flourishing uh, would, would, would increase. Um, uh, this sort of diagram provides, uh, uh, taken from the paper, um, some of the, the, the evidence for, um, for these claims, uh, the four uh, uh, pathways on the left and the five flourishing domains on the right, and these little numbers here are references in, in that paper to, again, uh, fairly rigorous uh, studies uh, from longitudinal experimental or quasi-experimental design suggesting uh, effects. In some cases, the evidence is quite substantial. In, in other cases, um, perhaps only uh, indicated by one or two uh, of these more rigorous studies and, and more work may be needed. Um, so I could say a lot more about um, you know, population perspectives on, on flourishing, but really what I would like to do now um, is turn to the question of, is any of this really relevant? Uh, for medicine and clinical practice. Um, and uh, um, and we, we are collecting data in a number of, of different um, uh, settings, um, in workplace settings and, and community settings and school settings, but importantly also uh, with, um, with, with clinical, in clinical settings, uh, mental health patients at, at, at Boston uh, University and uh, um, cancer patients at the University of Pittsburgh uh, Medical Center, um, along with medical students and, and residents at, at Johns Hopkins, at uh, Medical College of Georgia, at Stony Brook Medical School, um, and an increasing uh, number of, of, of others. So we're, we're trying to understand um, you know, the flourishing dynamics, both in patient uh, populations and in clinician populations, and also um, compare this to what uh, flourishing looks like with respect to the, the general public, both in the United States and, and with regard to the data that I had showed earlier, um, but then um, also uh, worldwide. And, and we are launching, in fact, a, uh, a global uh, flourishing study with 240,000 um, individuals in 22 countries with nationally representative um, sampling. So we'll, we'll really have a sense um, as to what, what flourishing looks like worldwide, and we'll be following these individuals up over um, time uh, with annual data collection um, to, to, to better understand the determinants of flourishing, um, but, but also to, to give us representative data um, to be able to compare um, to, to that in, in more specific settings, such as clinical settings. And, and I would like to make the case that um, flourishing, this notion of flourishing is relevant, at least in some um, clinical context, you know, may, maybe not appropriate for um, just a basic annual physical exam, but I, I do think when it comes to major treatment uh, decisions, um, the, 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 uh, a broader notion of flourishing may be Im important, and, and it may be important because these different flourishing domains may come into conflict uh, with, with one another. Um, as a couple of potential uh, examples, one might imagine a you know, man with bladder cancer, a cystectomy would maximize life expectancy, um, but perhaps substantially hamper quality of life and happiness. Um, alternatively, a scientist with, with psychotic symptoms, anti-psychotic medications suppress these, but really impede um, his capacity uh, to work. Or, or a woman with a positive BRCA test. Um, removal of ovaries would, would protect her against breast and ovarian cancer, um, but also make, make her in, infertile, um, depending on her um, goals and, and desires in life that might potentially compromise her, her social well-being, purpose, happiness. Um, or one can imagine a you know, celebrity chef with tongue cancer removal of the tongue would maximize survival but would affect social relationships and effectively end um, his working career. 
So in each of these cases, uh, physical health comes into conflict with um, some other end, some other domain of flourishing. And, and I think in these contexts, inquiring about what a patient considers important across these domains uh, is really going to be critical in assessing uh, with the patient what the right course of action um, might, might be. Um, and, and so, you know, I think this concept of flourishing and thinking about these domains can be helpful in, in decision making. Um, I think using a flourishing assessment, either the one I've suggested here or, or you know, there are other well-being measures out there as well, I think that can be um, valuable also. I think it might improve um, our research. One can imagine embedding just a, a simple a well-being assessment in, um, in, say, randomized trials of, of um, clinical interventions with, um, which may have uh, substantial side effects to see not only how the intervention might affect um, uh, d disease years of disease-free survival, but, but also uh, the individual's flourishing or, 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 or well-being. Um, and again, a simple assessment, 12-question assessment may give one a sense over time um, uh, what is taking place. I remember a conversation I had with a, um, a surgeon who, who said that, um, you know, in, in, in the case of um, uh, some of these surgery surgery tongue cancer, for example, um, they know from randomized trials that these surgeries do uh, improve um, survival. Um, but he'd have patients come back to him six months later saying they, they would want to die because the side effects were, were so severe. Um, so, I, you know, I think by embedding um, these flourishing measures into randomized trials, we, we will have a better sense of, of the trade-offs and may be able to make um, more informed and, and evidence-based decision-making, um, not just with regard to advancing the ends of physical health, but, but each of these flourishing um, domains. I think these flourishing assessments might also be useful with regard to um, the, the evaluation of, of care, um, uh, especially when thinking about sort of medium to long-term uh, assessments. Um, you know, I think sometimes patient satisfaction surveys, well, well I do believe they have their, their role, um, might sometimes re reflect more whether the patient was given what they, what they wanted immediately rather than how um, the care itself affected their, their, their long-term um, well-being. So I think these flourishing assessments might be useful in the evaluation of care. Um, I think they might also be useful in the practice of, of psychiatry, kind of to not just address mental illness, but to promote um, positive well, well-being in, in psychiatry, addressing these questions of, of, of relationships, of purpose, of character, um, which, which may themselves also be um, at the heart of some of the sources of, of mental uh, illness. Um, you know, in addition to, um, I think, being useful in, um, in, in decision-making and in, in assessment, I think there's good evidence also that a greater focus on, on well-being, on flourishing, um, also can help advance the end of, of physical uh, health. So, so there are now meta-analyses of a number of longitudinal studies indicating that different aspects of, um, of psychological well-being and social well-being um, and in fact extend extend life protective effects on, on mortality so um, uh, one meta analysis uh, fairly recently of 10 uh, longitudinal studies suggested that uh, purpose in life reduced mortality risk by about 17 uh, percent often over maybe a 10-year follow-up uh, period risk ratio of 0.83 um, that that life satisfaction um, likewise, uh, perhaps more modestly reduced uh, mortality risk in this meta-analysis by about 12%. Um, and that loneliness and social isolation increased uh, mortality risk uh, possibly about th by, by about 30%. So if we were able to address these other aspects of flourishing, purpose, um, life satisfaction, loneliness and social isolation, that that itself um, could uh, positively affect physical health. I think these notions of flourishing are also relevant um, for um, uh, trying to protect against clinician um, burnout. There's, of course, been a great deal of uh, discussion uh, recently and concern over um, uh, physician burnout rates being especially high. This, this preceded uh, 
the COVID-19 pandemic, but has been exacerbated even further um, with it. But there's a lot of variation in burnout rates across settings. So trying to understand how um, promoting different aspects of clinician well-being might improve um, this, this, this issue with, with, with burnout, I think would be, would be worthwhile. Um, uh, I, and I think we could pay attention to um, other aspects of clinicians' um, life and help them try to address uh, these problems. And one recent study of, of medical um, residents, it was quite disturbing when they went through um, the survey, the domain where they scored the lowest was, was physical and, and mental health. So what are we to make of and how are we to understand um, the current setting with regard to uh, clinical medicine with those who are to be healers are, are themselves most struggling in the area uh, where, where they're um, intended to, to heal. Their, their scores on social relationships were, were fairly comparable to, to national averages on purpose and character higher, on happiness and life satisfaction lower. But again, the, the lowest domain amongst in the study of medical residents was physical and mental health. These issues, I think, need to be taken seriously um, and, and addressed. And, and there's, you know, there's perhaps some preliminary suggestive evidence that, that things like finding meaning or having a sense of control or optimism and having psychological well-being may, may um, in fact, be protective factors against burnout. Um, so again, I'm, I'm not trying to suggest that um, this concept of flourishing is relevant for all aspects of, of, of clinical um, practice, but I think in, in major treatment decisions, I think in evaluating long-term care, I think in, um, in trying to um, help clinicians them, themselves, I think this notion of flourishing um, may, may, be, may be relevant. But in, in trying to kind of maybe characterize um, somewhat further um, what's, what's the role of this notion of flourishing in clinical medicine? Um, uh, I think it can be helpful to try to distinguish between two notions of health, and sort of the health of the body and the health of the person, or, or flourishing. Um, and, and I don't think the uh, clinician's role is, is to maximize uh, all aspects of, of, of flourishing. I mean, if we turn to that World Health Organization's definition of health, is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or, or infirmity. Uh, you know, it's not the clinician's role to maximize all aspects of social uh, well-being. Um, for example, I think the, the the notion of health put forward by the World Health Organization um, is, is is really the concept of the health of a of a person, or say, flourishing itself. Um, uh, and I think we might contrast that with a more narrow conception of health, the health of, of the body. Um, but I, I, don't, you know, I don't think the clinician's role is just restricted to health of the body either for some of the very reasons I had mentioned um, earlier. I mean, principally because tr treatment decisions affect aspects of a person's life which they care about, which extend beyond uh, physical health. Um, so while the clinician's role is you know, not to optimize a all aspects of, of flourishing in a person's life, again, the clinician's not principally a, a priest or a life coach or, or a marital counselor, um, I think just focusing on the health of the body is also too narrow. So the proposition I would like to, to, to put forward, and, um, and this was put forward in a um, response to a letter that, that came in um, in, 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 in JAMA um, to our, our paper on flourishing, but um, the, you know, the, the proposition I would like to put forward, drawing this distinction between the, the health of the body and the health of the person, is that the role of the, of the physician is to promote wholeness or health of the person, in other words, flourishing, as it pertains to decisions concerning health of the body. So it's not to you know, maximize all aspects of a person's life, but in any decision concerning um, the health of the body, one wants to take into account in that decision all aspects of, um, of flourishing. Um, so that, that's what I would put forward with regard to uh, potentially the role of the concept of flourishing in medicine. Uh, so does flourishing matter in medicine? Again, I would, I would argue yes. Um, I, I, think, um, I think it's an important concept and I, I think assessments are also uh, Im important. Um, I think measurement is worthwhile because it shapes what we discuss. And so I think to, to neglect this concept or the assessment 
um, of flourishing, I think really reduces um, policies and decision making uh, to, to, to the purely material, to physical health and, and financial um, status. And, and people do care about those things. They care deeply about those things, but they care about more than that. They care also about, about being happy, about having a sense of meaning and, and purpose, about trying to be a good person, about their relationships. Um, and, and so in decision making um, for, for patients and, and for uh, clinicians, I think this a notion of, of flourishing is, is relevant. I think it would be good when appropriate to assess flourishing in medicine because again, patients care about many aspects of life, not just health. Um, I think many treatment decisions, again, involve these trade-offs across the domains. We've seen that psychological well-being can affect physical health. I think this notion of flourishing implies care of the whole person. Um, I think focusing on this notion of flourishing might help prevent uh, burnout in, within medicine. And, and I think what we measure shapes what we discuss, what we study, uh, what we know, what we aim for, and the policies put in place to try to uh, achieve this. So I, you know, I think asking these questions about flourishing has the potential uh, to accomplish these, these various goals. Flourishing isn't relevant for all aspects of medicine, uh, but I think it, it is relevant for, um, for many. So my, my hope is that this concept of flourishing, these flourishing assessments might help us to move towards advancing both the health of the body and the health of the person. Thank you.